Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. Today's episode is a great episode. Today's episode, we go really deep and with someone that is really passionate about graduates and he's passionate about you taking control and growing your career. On this episode, we speak about overseas travel, starting a side project while you're working full time different cultures and how they work. We talk about all this different stuff related to mentorship, ways to kind of plan and build out your career. There's so much value in this episode. We covered so many different angles of so many different things. So this episode for me is one of my favorites. If you want to get this episode straight to your inbox, if you want to read my insights and what I picked up from this episode, please go to graduatetheory.com and subscribe to the newsletter. On there, you're going to get my thoughts and different things that I picked up from the podcast. You'll also find more information about different things that we spoke about on the episode today. Without further ado, let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. My guest today graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Melbourne in 2015. He has worked at Goldman Sachs and PwC where he worked in Silicon Valley on billion-dollar deals like the Uber IPO. Since returning to Australia at the start of this year, my guest has started working as the Australia New Zealand Finance Manager for Airwallex. He works as a mentor at VC firm Blackbird and a startup mentor at Textbook Ventures. On top of all this, My guest runs his company, 87 Advisory, where he helps small businesses perform financial due diligence over their M&A and venture capital process. So please welcome to the show, the highly accomplished Haynes D'Souza. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me on. That was a very warm and generous introduction. So happy to feel free to keep going. That that was great. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've done so much and it's going to be a great conversation today. I'm really excited to to get into all the things that you've done in your career. And and one thing when I was researching you, one thing that really stuck out to me was this move that you made from Australia over to America and into Silicon Valley. And I wanted to ask, was there a key moment that led to you making that decision to go to Silicon Valley? Sure. So right before right before I moved over to SF, I, I did two, two years in Canberra and I worked at the Australian National Audit Office. And Two years in Canberra, like I I initially started very optimistic about sort of government. I wanted to learn how government works. I wanted to learn how the military worked. I spent a lot of time looking at consulting and and audit projects for the military and also the Department of Finance. But then I I got to the end of two years and I just wasn't, wasn't being challenged. I felt like I was, I was in my mid twenties and I, I looked at people five, 10, 15 years sort of older than me. And I didn't really find that 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 trajectory was, was too challenging. And so I've always been a big believer. Like, I think all Aussies should, should go and work overseas. And so I I reached out to a few networks at PwC and where I worked in Melbourne for a bit and then said, look, I I really want to go to San Francisco. People said, look, it's, it's a lot like Melbourne. The coffee scene is, is just as, is just as good. It's just as expensive. Interestingly, there was either that or, or Germany. And that was, that was sort of the the thing. And I I sort of hated German food anyway. So I made the move (laughs) across to, to San Francisco and was, yeah, there for about two years and that's sort of where I caught the tech bug. So I worked on the, the Uber IPO and just met some amazing people and, and saw the work ethic of the entrepreneurialism and just changed my outlook on many things, not sort of just work related, but sort of life more generally. Um, and then you work overseas, you go there and you see folks that have gone to Harvard and Stanford and, and some of the elite universities and, and work in these amazing jobs and you try to internalize some of those learnings and, and bring them back home. And, and that's sort of what I've tried to do, sort of being with Airwallex right now and doing a whole bunch of some mentoring and advisory work as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's really exciting. And were there any, are there any key, like you, you mentioned you're there, you were connecting with people that went to these like Ivy League unis, which is incredible. But are there any, what are the main lessons that you've taken from connecting with those people and working on those projects? Is there anything that really sticks out to you as something that you've taken back? Yeah, sure. Look, I think the they it's like being in australia i think sort of growing up in australia like we came to australia when i was eight and grew up in the northern suburbs of melbourne and for a long time that was sort of the world i knew that's the northern suburbs of, of melbourne and then you you meet other aussies when you travel and, and you see that their perspectives are global right and, and you, your ability to make a difference is 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 global and, and so when when i meet sort of folks in san francisco they're the most 
the biggest takeaway for me is that like, don't be afraid of starting an idea or having a business that can have a global impact on things. Sometimes in Melbourne, we, we can sort of get isolated. Even in Australia, we, we can get isolated being on this part of the world and, and sort of lose sight of what's going on in the States and Europe. But that sort of that's almost the antithesis of what I saw folks in, in San Francisco. They're like, look, there's a big problem. I'm going to try to fix it globally. And there is nothing that, you know, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take no for an answer. So that, that relentless optimism, that relentless drive is what I saw in many Aussies in San Francisco and, and many sort of US folks out there as well. And I highly recommend all graduates, all, all sort of young adults to, to go over to the States, experience it, almost see that secret source of optimism positivity, a relentless ambition, the drive to basically, there's a problem, I'm going to try to fix it. That, that the grind of that hustle is sometimes we, we lack that in, in Australia. Like I'll give you a really good example. Like you, you go there and you meet folks that have second or third jobs, you know, ha, as grads, they'll, they'll be a grad at sort of PwC and then on, on the side, they'll do tutoring or they're a nurse, but you know, on the side and on weekends, they might work sort of retail as well, which that sort of concept of having second and third jobs is very foreign, at least in, in sort of the circles that I hang around in Australia. And it, it's not to say that's a positive because there are a whole bunch of sort of social issues that, that are there that forces people to be in that position, but just that grit and that determination and that positivity and that relentless drive it is something that really stood out to me when I was there. Mm. Yeah, that, that's true. That's interesting. It's it's great and, to, and, you know, have that experience and take it back as well. Yeah. And you sort of wonder why we, we don't really see that mm. in Australia. And I was listening to this interesting podcast, this podcast episode called the Aussie Startup Playbook Podcast. And I, I think that one of the episodes there where they talk about the, you know, tall poppy syndrome in Australia and the fact that we, you always get pegged back a couple of notches in, in Australia if you are seen to be working a little bit harder and going and taking that extra risk and you get your mates saying it's a friday night why aren't you going out why are you still working why are you working your, your tutoring gig or why do you have your business or what why do you have xyz just come out with the rest of it in the states especially in san francisco it, it is the norm to to spend your weekends working on a on a side project on a side hustle like that that is seen as the norm and, and maybe it is that sort of cultural difference where Sort of in Australia, you know, being on this side of the world, being that lucky country, we're afford to, we, we can afford to, to be a bit more chill about things, which I never really saw in San Francisco. It was sort of go, go, go at all times. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting, that cultural shift. And I've heard that as well about the tall poppy syndrome about when, like you were saying, when someone starts to do a bit more, like people are kind of like, well, you should be trying so hard, like just chill, man. Like right, exactly, you know, exactly, like, right. Yeah. So sort of interested to, to hear in your social sort of group here, James. Like, how, how many folks mm. have a side hustle or like an e-commerce store or sort of a, a second source of like uh, side hustle that on on top of their sort of nine to five? Yeah, yeah. I don't know really. None that I can think of off the top of my head. I think the. The most like hardworking people I know are the ones that maybe they work a few hours extra like at their corp at their job or whatever. Maybe they work right. ten hours a day yeah. or something. But they, yeah, not many people have that thing that they're you know they after work then they're straight on to something yeah. else. I think it's yeah. usually like clock out and like Netflix time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I think one of my mentors back in in SF would tell me, look, everyone's got their nine to five, but then everyone's got their five to nine as well, <laughs> which, which is something yeah. that sort of stuck with me. And man, it's something that oh, you know, yeah, something I encourage everyone. Those who can should definitely look to to at least learn another skill or or to side hustle their way into something. Yeah. Yeah, because because on that you you have your own side hustles and things that you do. You're obviously involved in a lot of things in the startup world in Australia. Was there any kind of and this this whole belief that you have, you know, around having a startup and how great that can be? Did that stem from this time in Silicon Valley, or was there a key moment that you were like, okay, these this is this kind of thing is going to be really beneficial for people? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I stayed in New York for a while, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic and stayed in sort of Lower East Side, right in the, in the middle of COVID. And so for the Australian sort of listeners listening to this, I don't know if you guys remember Cuomo, so Governor Cuomo having his daily press conferences. And I was in, in Manhattan, right in the middle of that. And I saw the impact that COVID has on, on small businesses and I, that sort of stuck with me 
because you know uh, you, you just picture this you're sort of living in sort of manhattan and you're surrounded by these like bodegas and delis and sort of family stores and sort of immigrant families coming to america putting the whole life savings into this tiny little grocery or deli COVID happens, the entire city is deserted, everything stops, yet you see these business owners still trying to, to make a living. And that sort of, that visual stuck with me. And a big part of what I, a big part of my values and what I've learned is you, you should always try to outwork and have that grit and determination to not just have your nine to five, but, you know, have a business on the side. And, and that's really sort of stuck with me. I've seen going back to New York and, and seeing these delis with these family businesses that they were closing down. Their, their kids, these are kids of immigrant folks, would go to school or would have their day job, but would come back and work in their parents' sort of business and, and help them out with inventory, with marketing and all these sort of things. And I sort of took a step back and, and said, look, I, I can do my nine to five, my sort of corporate job. I've worked with folks that have done that. And that's certainly fine. Folks have kids and, and families and, and other commitments. And that's certainly cool. But I, I saw the level of grit and drive and determination there. And I thought that that's really freaking amazing, right? Like we, I, I, I don't want to look back at the end of my career. So for grads listening to this and young folks, we're probably going to work for about 40 to 50 years. I, I don't want to look back at the end of that saying, I didn't take a risk. I, I didn't go out and build something and, and and have something that will last post my career. I really want to have an impact. So that's that's sort of the fuel that is in me to to go, look, yeah, you, you've got your day job, but then where else can I add value? Where else can I, like, what other challenges and projects that I can take on? So that, that sort of visual of being in the Lower East Side, the city's deserted. You've got an immigrant family with a ton of debt, paying a ton in rent still trying to make that work. That sort of grit, that sort of stuck with me. The second part, I think in high school, I had a really formative economics teacher. I, I was sort of probably in year 10 and 11, 16, 17 years old, didn't really know what to do. I, I, I When I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. Turns out you have to be good at physics and I suck at physics. So that was out the door. <laughs> and then I had this, his name is Lucas Robenda and I had him as my economics teacher and he explained the world to me in in through markets like demand and supply. I thought this is really interesting. And ha as I spent more time learning economics and, and sort of learning how markets work, it became really clear to me the power of owning assets. You can either be, you know, some form of different forms of resources, capital, labor, natural, but sort of learning economics, even through university, the, the big thing that stuck with me is you, you want to be in a position where you're owning assets. And a big part of that was through high school economics and, and playing games like Monopoly and realizing, look, hang on a minute, if you own all the, all the properties on Monopoly and, and everyone's passing by and paying your rent, then you're in a, and you're in a good spot. And so <laughs> that sort of stuck with me, right? It sounds really strange to say, but the ability of owning assets and, and building businesses and, all, and owning equity is, is something that stuck with me. So applying that now... Um, you know, you work in a big bank or you work in an accounting firm, you're sort of an employee. And I, I wanted to see at, at least the hard work that I'm putting in result in a commercial and financial sort of impact for myself. Uh, as an employee, you don't, you don't necessarily see that because you're, you're getting a wage for working those 40 hour weeks, but you, you don't really see what the business is growing. How, how am I directly being compensated for that? And, and so a big part of that was owning assets and, and having equity. And to, to extend that a bit more, well, if I start a business or if I invest in other companies and have that almost uh, rich dad, poor dad mindset, which everyone seems mm. to read now, that sort of, that would help. So those are probably the two things that kind of got me into to this path. Yeah. I, th I think that's really cool. And I think it's, it's great that you're, you're, you have that experience and those things that are driving you towards this. And then you're also helping people on their path to do this as well. I think it's really great. What are some, like, I'm not sure, have you seen people go through this kind of startup period where they're creating their company and they want to turn it into something big? Are there any trends that you see in the people trying this that perhaps makes them more likely to succeed than not? Sure. Yeah. I think there, there's, I'd say three things in what I've seen recently, at least in Australia of folks starting businesses and, and whether that takes off or not. I think one is this circle of competence. You are more likely to succeed in your business if the business that you're in falls within an area that you're either really competent in or really passionate about. It's no secret that 
being a business owner is, is tough. Uh, you're working weekends, you're working long hours. If you're either not really, really competent or have a team that's really competent, or you're not really passionate about what you're doing, you know, then forget about it because you will be found out and it, your short term sort of interest and enthusiasm lasts a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And then it, you sort of, you'll, you find it very difficult. So, so that's one. I think the second thing is it, it's all about, I, I call it structural shifts. You, you, you want to have a, a business that has tailwinds, structural and economic tailwinds. There's no point now making in 2021, making sort of Kodak cameras, right? Because they're just, no one's going to buy them. Similarly, you, you want to be having, solving a problem, but also doing it in a way that is, is commercially viable and there are structural tailwinds behind this. So there's a really good website called trends.io where, where they actually show you what people are Googling. They will show you what on a retail side, like what, what are people interested in? Where? Where are the conversations happening? Where are the structural sort of forces in the economy? Where, where are they shifting it? And what direction are the wind blowing? And you want to have a business that is almost going downstream as opposed to fighting upstream. Mm -hmm. So a couple of really good examples on this that I've seen recently is I was advising a, a company yesterday where two founders are building a business very similar to Mr. Yum. Mr. Yum is an Australian sort of, a, it's like a technology company that's helping restaurants take their menus online and ability to order via QR codes and make reservations digitally. And, and that's such a big sort of problem right now, right? So it, everyone is going uh, into restaurants, they have QR codes and there, there is a structural shift and movement into using technology in restaurants. And, and so these guys have started the business to, to take advantage of that. And they basically, it, it's so much easier because they've got this massive structural tailwind behind them, as opposed to doing something that is going uh, against the wind. So I hope that sort of that analogy makes sense. Capital understanding and capitalizing structural shifts. Um, right now, and, and probably the third thing is, is sort of resources both sort of capital resources and people. Again, sort of depending on what sort of your business is and how capital intensive or how technical it is, you've got, you've got to have the right people, the right skills, the right financing, the right liquidity, uh, liquidity to survive. In, in startup worlds, we talk about zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 100. And each of those have different requirements from a, a resourcing perspective. And I define resourcing as people and financial. And, and so, in each of those, you have to sort of figure out, well, exactly what are the key skills I need to go from zero to one, 10 to 100, so zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 100. What other skills do I need? Where am I lacking? And, and then, you know, sort of going from there. So those are probably the three things that I, that I see that sort of determine if something grows or not in, in very sort of high level terms. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are really, really great pieces of advice. And I totally resonate with that. What you were saying about the tailwinds and, and things like that, because if you look at almost any company, really the timing of when they came out with their product is one of the most important things in their success. And they're, they're always riding some kind of underlying trend. Like even if it's something like Google and Facebook and things like that, they're, they're all riding the, just like the growth of the internet almost. Sure. Um, yeah. Ab and that's, and that, yeah. And yeah. even like, let's say someone starts a YouTube channel, like being early on YouTube, it, even if you're not even that good at YouTube, but being early and yeah. writing the trend of it, as just as an example, is going to yeah. be a massive factor, even maybe more so than your actual skill in doing it. So yeah, I, t I totally agree with that. Yeah, and absolutely. And just to, to go through a few examples and extend this a little bit, you know, it'd be like, let, let's play, have, let's have a hypothetical here. Would, would the Tim Ferriss, you know, podcast be as popular today, right? as it is right now, if it started today, right? Because right now there, there's a multi, there, there's several podcasts, right? And, and the Tim Ferriss show is probably the one, one of the most popular ones out there. Now, he was one of the first sort of productivity performance coach sort of type podcasts. I'd probably guess that if he started that now, it probably won't be as successful in, in sort of four or five years that in what it has been right now. I think he was one of the first people to do it and do it well. You also look at a lot of sort of social media companies, a lot of tech companies where the timing is right. You can be too early, you can be too late. And just finding that structural tail and having that momentum where it all sort of comes together and all, all your ducks are in line. I think that's, yeah, some of it's skill and some of it's just like timing, the right place, mm. right time. Yeah. I think that's 
That's really cool. And it's a good point about the about Tim Ferriss because there's even a book that he he's spoken about. It's called the Immutable Twenty Two Immutable Laws of Marketing, I think. Right, and one okay. of the things in, in there is about almost creating your own category or creating your own niche and things like that. And that's the same idea where like we'll create our own, you know, we'll be the first podcaster talking about productivity, <laughs> you know, which is yeah. almost what he did. And then he's able to ride the trend of podcasts becoming popular. And then that's enabled as well as like his, his own growth growing as, as if normally would, you're also riding the underlying trend as well growing. So like I've even seen, there's this note, note taking software I use called Obsidian. And it's this just nice way, similar to Notion in many ways, but I started using it like in March last year and it was quite early on. And there were certain people in there that were starting to do tutorials and things like that. And it's the growth of that community has yeah. really enabled the growth of their own brand, like probably more so than them actually improving and just growing it if yeah. the community was at the same like the same level. So yeah. Yeah. I, I sort of another kind of example time. just to, to add to that is look at some of the early YouTubers, right? So I remember sort of Casey, Neistat, Mr. Beast, all these really famous folks right now started, mm. I probably want to say five to 10 years ago. If Casey mm. Neistat started today, it's so competitive now that I don't think he would be where he's at if he started sort of right now. Look at mm. TikTok, the, the D'Amelio sisters, right? If, if they jumped on TikTok now, would they be as successful as what, what they would have been recently? I, I don't know. It, it's, it's an interesting hypothetical. It's to the point of you, 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 timing is everything when, when starting a business. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to view businesses from a, um, from, from how, what is a problem and how we, we can solve it to how what are underlying social trends that we can piggyback of and, and sort mm. of ride that way. And nothing lasts forever, right? So it would be interesting to, to see what some of the Aussie sort of tech companies, especially your Atlassians, your, your Canvas, how, how they ride that wave. And, and, and a big part of that is also pivoting. Once you've realized, look, you've, you're in your first wave and, and that sort of, that, that growth is starting to slow down. Where can I pivot and, and switch to next? And sometimes you'll find the pivot can be more uh, successful than the original push as well. For good examples of this. So right now, Apple, I feel like, is, is mid-pivot where they're a computing company, but now they're sort of pivoting into more of a services company with with the whole bunch of products they have right now. So Twitter is another good one. If, if folks want to Google, so successful company pivots. Yeah, sort of just realizing that sometimes structural tailwinds change and sometimes it, it, it's on your company to to shift along with that and not be sort of resistant to that change are there any trends that you see at the moment that you think you know we're almost right at the start of like similar to how we're talking about the internet and different communities and things like that what do you think we're at the start of at the moment and what kind of things would you would you almost bet on <laughs> sure you know, yeah you popular let's say in five years Right. I, I think let's, let's shorten that. Let, let's see where we've come from first in, in the last six or 12 months. And, and, and then sort of mm. let, let's draw, extend that out for the next few years or so. So at, at least in Australia and so globally, we've been in lockdowns for as long as I can remember. I want to say sort of two years. And everyone is, is working from home. Everyone's eating from home. Everyone's working out from home. Everyone's doing Zoom calls now. I think there are, there's a fundamental change in the way people interact. And I don't think that we are going back to where we were previously, at least not to that same level. I think mm. there is a greater, so in terms of like consumer behavior, I think there has been a structural shift and a greater acceptance for eating at home, getting your groceries delivered at home, working out at home. And, and so that, that's my one sort of takeaway is that we are more comfortable now to use sort of technology to, to get things delivered and, and work sort of remotely. I think the second big takeaway is, is that I've seen so many people now start up e-commerce stores, Shopify stores, start blogs and blogs and TikTok. And the, the second shift that I've seen in the last sort of two years, people are, are going away from content consumption to content generation. Like, I think it's a lot more acceptable now for people to create content regard like whether it's a TikTok websites, YouTube podcasts, whatever. I think that's becoming more socially acceptable. So those are sort of the two big trends I've seen recently. I, and now, so when I think, when I, when I think ahead, you know, how, how, how will this play out in, in the next, you know, five to 10 years? So if you're, I, I, I love tech companies. I, you know, I really believe in the power of uh, technology to disrupt dinosaur industries. But if you're 
in the space where you're helping people take what was previously a outdoor function and you can help bring that indoors or, or even better do it remotely. I think there, there, there is a structural tailwind there. So what do I mean by that? So if you're a, a company that's, that's facilitating or, or enabling food delivery, remote working, remote like telecommunications uh, as well, I think that's a structural tailwind there. That That's a place where I think it, we will not go back to old ways of working because I think that's just fundamentally changed. So the, the winners of this are probably your companies like Zoom, your companies like Peloton, the losers of this commercial real estate. Like I'd hate to be CBRE right now. Yeah. And I like, it's, it's interesting to see how that will, will, will work in, in the next five or 10 years. So I, yeah, definitely think if you're, if you're starting a company where you're helping people to be more remote and helping them live their, you know, best lives in a, you know, geographically agnostic way, then I think that's, you're, you're onto something there. I think that's that principle. The second principle is sorry that we've seen that people are now being content creators as, and that's being okay. And, and that's being encouraged. Well, if you're setting a business where you're helping people or you're advising people in terms of their marketing, their content creation, whether it's data analytics and, and how to improve understanding their audience metrics, I think that's a big push there that a, a big structural tailwind that you can sort of piggyback off in that. And it is now starting to become quite a congested space. Like there, there are a lot of folks there that are sort of social media consultants and it, it's a very congested space. But I think that even if you look at YouTube, for example, you get so many niches in whether it's some, some examples, you know, property or animals or art, these sort of niches, which were previously no one really vlogged them buying a house, but now I'm seeing so much of that and, and sort of figure out a way where you, you can be part of that, that space. I, and I, I know what the answer is right now, but that, that is definitely a structural tailwind. It is becoming now more socially acceptable to be content creators as opposed to just content consumers. So that's another thing. I think an, another shift that I've seen recently is again, going, touching back to what we talked about previously of, of people having multiple jobs. I, I really think the the future is Folks, you know, the, the future work model, I don't think is necessarily five days a week, nine to five. I, I think that COVID and, and lockdowns have shown that, you know what, people can actually get work done when, when they're not in the office. And sometimes not even when it's nine to five, the folks are in different time zones. I remember when I was in, in the States, COVID hit, a lot of people left San Francisco, New York, and decided to go to midtown uh, cities, decided to go to Hawaii and Latin America. Uh, and they still got their work done, but the point I'm trying to make is this, this nine to five, you've got to be in the office culture, I think is, is, yeah, I don't think we'll have that anymore. So mm. what does that mean going forward? And what are the tailwinds? It means that I think a couple of things. One, I think people are more likely to take on second and third jobs, whether it's, I'm going to work this job sort of, you know, four days a week, another job, one day a week, and another job, another half a day a week, or I'm going to, you know, work three jobs and I'm going to try to work part-time all three and it's going to be five days a week or leveraging sites like, you know, uh, Fiverr and Airtasker and being in that gig economy space where I'm not really an employee, but I'm still, I'm still working and, and I'm being part of the, the gig economy space. So mm. I think that's, that's another sort of takeaway that I've seen in the last two years that I still think will stick around for the next five or 10 years and that will be a structural tailwind. So in terms of starting a business in this space, it's, I, I think gig economy and, and understanding, well, okay, so you're a contractor, what, what are the skills that I have and what are the gaps that are, are there out there that I can plug in and, and work on in? So for example, if you're an engineer, can I take on freelance engineering gigs? If you're a visual creator or a visual artist in, in, in Colombia, can, can I take on a few tasks? that are in the US or in Australia and get paid in dollars, but again, live in, in pesos, for example. So mm. I, I think you'll see a lot of that coming through in the next few years. So yeah, I, I definitely think it, it's not a good place to be if you're a commercial real estate, because <laughs> I think folks just working remotely and things are becoming very location agnostic. So I think those mm. are some of the structural tailwinds that I was sort of talking about there as well. And, and I think, and, and just sort of another point I'd like to add is I think companies that are realizing the power of users' data, and I, I think my suspicion is a lot of these sort of large tech companies, big structural tailwind that I'm seeing is that 
they're, they're realizing they're realizing that customer data is really valuable, and the, in, in acknowledging that, they, they've decided to almost build platforms. I think if you have a business where you're a platform where you're connecting both buyers and sellers, or you're yeah, you're a platform where you're providing multiple products and services that are both interconnected in different ways, but you're a platform that and, and having that moat, I think that is a structural shift that I'm seeing where companies are now going, well, how can I be a marketplace? How can I be a platform? And you'll see a lot of these companies where you'll see a lot of investor pitch decks where they talk about we're a platform, we connect buyers and sellers, and we rely on network benefits, or we we want to build a suite of products, not just sort of one, but we want to build a suite of products and try to get, fill in that, that value gap from, from sort of uh, low to all the way to the nth degree. I think, I think that's sort of another change that I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really exciting. All these, all these things we've got to look forward to in the future. And yeah, some of those are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited to, for those to come to fruition. I want to take this conversation into more of your career and things now. I'm curious if there's a particular failure that you've had in your career that you would say, okay, that that's my favorite failure. That's one that allowed me to do or really having that experience led me to, to greater things. Was there any failures that almost are your favorites? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I've got several, James. I've got several. Yeah. I don't know, I'm trying to think of the, the one that sort of had the biggest impact. I, I joined PwC when, when I was 18, PwC Australia. I was a trainee. I applied when I was in high school. I barely knew, to be honest, I barely knew what PwC was in high school. I just sort of applied because I know, I think I, I came across a website and they were, they were looking for folks and I thought I'll, I'll apply and see what sort of happens. And I was sort of lucky enough to, to join as a trainee and I was there for yeah, just under two years. And then some of the, I think my biggest sort of feedback that I had was that was my first job and sort of understanding how to communicate co in a corporate way and I deal with clients in sort of corporate way. I had some really sort of strong feedback on, on what Haynes, this is, this is how you should think about dealing with clients. And this, this is how you sort of put together a memo this, in, in the audit world. This is how you put together a work paper and, and this is sort of how you, you deal with client relationships. All that was new to me. I was sort of end of first year uni that I started and was all new to me. And I think the, the biggest sort of failure I had at that point, oh, it wasn't so, so much failure, but just having a lot of really constructive feedback, which you never really get in high school or at university, because a lot of that feedback is just academic. You got an essay, you got a test, did you do well or not? And how could you have improved? But sort of in, in the corporate workplace, and this was my first job, and I had some really, really po like constructive, but really strong sort of feedback on if you're in a meeting, th these are, this is sort of how you go about dealing with clients. So if, if this is a client problem, this is how you should go about sort of fixing it. If you're sort of putting together a, a, an audit work paper, it gets sort of very technical. No one really showed me how, how the corporate world works. It's, it's an interesting sort of skill set at, at that point. This is how you put together an audit work paper. This is how you interpret and apply accounting standards. And and just sort of feedback along the way that was, it, it showed me a couple of things. It showed me one that we do like just generally, it's like I, we do a really poor job of teaching folks and getting them workplace ready and, and job ready, right? You go from high school to university and then bang, you're, you're in work and you're wearing an oversized suit in, uh, and you're in meetings and you don't really know what's going on. But I, I think that sort of initial sort of training and, and I, yeah, I, I think that I'm sure it's got a lot better now, but you know, that transition from high school straight into the workplace, that was a very steep transition for me. And I, I probably made a ton of mistakes in, in there as well. The second thing I learned was that audit was probably not, and, and still is not for me. I was an audit there and one of my first clients was a listed fund in a uh, listed fund manager. It was an infrastructure, infrastructure fund, Hastings fund management. That was my first client there. And I think I quickly realized pretty early on that audit was not what I wanted to do for the next 40 years. I had this sort of uh, misconception when I first uh, joined was that your first job is basically what you'll be doing for the next 40 years and your career is mm. linear. But you know what? That's not the case. And at, at that point, I realized, you know what? Audit's not for me. I didn't wake up, you know, every morning saying this. This is what I want to do for for the rest of my career. I wanted something a bit more engaging. Yeah, as opposed to retrospective work and working for clients, I felt like I, I wanted to build my own thing. I want to do my own thing, and that was sort of the, the thing that I learned. But yeah, sort of the biggest failure was during sort of 
it wasn't a one sort of thing, but it was just, um, how to, how to think and how to communicate in, in a corporate way with sort of keeping your client sort of first. I think that was a big takeaway, um, for me, but yeah, along the way, look, I, I've made so many mistakes. Like I, I was, I think I was telling you this before, but you know, I remember the, the one time I was my first client, one of my senior consultants told me to print, print a few files and print a few documents. And I was like, yeah, okay, fine. Probably like my first week of joining PwC, I'll go print some stuff and walk around to the, the printers room where all these massive corporate printers are. And, and I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about, these massive printers. I was used to having just a normal sort of printer at home. And so I knew how that worked. And then I remember the senior telling me, go print this stuff. It has to be color, double-sided, give me a whole bunch of stuff. I'm like, yes, 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 I've got this. How hard can it be? Print some papers and I'm done. <laughs> I walk into the printers and I was just intimidated by this massive thing. It was like, I, you needed to have a card to, to swipe in, in, in and, and use the printer. And it was, it was just nuts. And so I spent 45 minutes in the printer room, just trying to figure out how this printer worked. And, and I was like, what am I doing? I can't print this. And it's taken me 45 minutes. Like, wh what is a senior consultant going to think of me? I'm done. This is not going to work. But yeah, I, I think she came, you know, she was like, what is Haynes doing? Why is he taking this long to print a few pieces of paper? And uh, I think she sort of helped me out at the end, but that was sort of um a big realization that there is so much that I don't know and, and I should be open and honest and say, look, I don't know how to do this thing. Just help me out. And I don't think I'm the only one in this situation. I think there are a lot of grads listening to this where they're like, okay, I've got these really dumb, silly questions that I, I should know how to do, but I don't because I've never experienced this before. Like my advice is just suck it up and ask for help. It doesn't matter how silly it is. Yeah. That, that was an interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great advice too, and asking those questions and even getting in the habit of some people have told me, you know, ask those questions earlier <laughs> yes, so that yeah, when yeah. you're six months into it and you, you yeah. sort of haven't asked, they assume that you know what you're doing by that point. So yeah. it becomes difficult, even more difficult then to ask. <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Better to get I, them out that's really early, yeah. Yeah, I, I always encourage people to ask questions upfront and early because the last, that's, that's much easier and that, that's a better outcome than waiting right until the end. And, and then figuring out, oh, sorry, I, I didn't know this. And so I've just wasted all my time spinning my wheels. Like that's, that's something I advise all my teams and all my mentees, just be upfront, just own your areas that you need help with. Because we were all, we were all grads at one point. So you, you think about some of the most inspirational and, and intimidating folks that you might've worked with and just realize, look, everyone was an intern. Everyone was a grad. We've all been there. We sort of overthink things sometimes, right? So. Yeah, but just remove that away and, and just be sort of direct in, in seeking help. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And speaking of questions and asking questions, you've, like you were saying, you moved around a little bit, uh, even finding out all that wasn't for you and, and things like that. Are there any questions that you, that you ask when you're moving roles and when you're in somewhere you don't want to go and you're looking for somewhere else to go? What kind of questions would you ask? people would get ready to move into something that you might prefer? Yeah. I think that's a really good question because you don't really know what something is like and unless you've, I think you've experienced it, but you can, there's a couple of things you can ask folks that are in that role or folks in that company before you join and say, look, what's the career trajectory you like? What's the, is the company growing? What's the culture like? Why is this role opened? Has someone left? If so, why did they leave? What, what's the, what, what? What's the message that, what's the vision that some of the key founders and executives have? These are all some of your almost investigative questions that you're asking to figure out if something is the right fit for you. And I think one of the things that's really important to think about when you're interviewing for jobs, it's they're interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. And so like, I understand what the culture is like. I understand do, do folks go out at the end of the week to have dinner at work or is it everyone does their own thing? Do, do folks appreciate you asking for help or is it more independent? Is it a, is it a big team? Is it a small team? What does career progression look like? Where, where do folks that work in this role end up in five or 10 years time? Those questions I'd, I'd ask and I'd think about. When I joined Air Wallex, before I accepted the role, I, I was sort of lucky. I knew a couple of people there that, that already worked there and I reached out to them and I said, look, I'm, I'm interviewing. What's the culture like? Do you enjoy working there? 
what are your hours like? Because you, you'll get the HR sort of feel, mm. right? But you really want to figure out what's going on. So my advice is just reach out to folks that work there. If you've got mutual connections on LinkedIn, especially, and just understand where is the company growing? And if, if you were in this role for the next five years, where would you end up? And what are the skills that you'll have? And one thing, James, I'd, I'd probably wrap this with, with this context of your career is not linear. And this is sort of touching back on, on what I said previously. When, when I first started, I, I thought a career is linear. It, it's this linear trajectory. You go from grad to analyst to a senior analyst to, to a manager. And it, it's not like that. I hate to break it to, to everyone. It's, it definitely doesn't work like that. Um, it, think of it almost as a roller coaster where there are times where you, there are phases where you will go linear. But then you might pivot into another company or you might change roles, you might change careers, you might have a family, you might have kids, you might take some time off and you might take a couple of steps sideways. You might skip a couple of steps. The point I'm trying to make, it's not linear. And, and the, I think career counselors do a disservice to everyone by telling folks that, okay, this is the job you want and this is a linear part to get to that. I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. It, it's more about experience, developing your experiences and your skill sets. And if, if you want to be an, uh, an audit partner, yes, it might seem linear, but you know, a lot of folks are now working in industry for a couple of years and then coming back. If you want to be a CFO, it, it's, there's different ways of going about it. And you've got the, the banking road, you've got sort of the, the controller road, you've got the VP way of going about it or the FPNA way of going about it. So especially sort of type A personalities that are just about to enter into the workforce, they, they see things as linear. I, my strong advice is to not see it that way. You will have kids at some point or travel, or you'll take some time off to, to go do your own thing or set up your own business. And that's okay. Um, and, and that's sort of the, I was telling my sister this the other day, actually, and she's applying for grad jobs right now. It's, it's like, it's, it's not linear. You're allowed to not know exactly what you want. It's okay to try different things and, and almost sort of sample different jobs and, and see what you like and see what you don't like. I'm a big fan of just reaching out to folks in the jobs that you aspire to get and picking their brain over coffee or a Zoom and say, look, I... This is why I want, this is why I'm interested in the role. I, I want to understand what your day to day is. This is why I think I could be a good fit. But I, I like before I invest uh, my time and, and, and sort of my career, I want to understand if this is the right fit for me. Um, and and you'll, you'll find that you'll avoid making a whole load of mistakes if you go down this sort of coffee chat sort of approach to understanding what, what a career is all about. There's that, that's one sort of way of going about it. I spoke to another friend of mine who decided to do a master's. He, he worked in investment banking, didn't re realize that he didn't really want to do that long term. His passion was engineering. So he did his master's in engineering and through the course of doing his master's program, he realized, yeah, this, this, is, this is actually what I want to do. It, it validated to him what his interests and passions are and, and sort of confirmed that, yes, this is what he wants to do for for the foreseeable future. Right? And now, yeah, he's sort of working sort of in data analytics and, and sort of computer science and he really enjoys that. So that's another option of taking that post-grad study as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I think those questions, especially that one you mentioned, or the, there's so much you mentioned there, but that, that question about where is, if, if I get this role, where do I end up? Where do people that have done this previously go? I think that's a really great question. And I think what you were saying about sitting down with people for coffee, I think is really important too, especially if they're, you don't necessarily have to know them before reaching out either. And I think that's likely something that you've done too, is reaching out to people who work there. Maybe like you said, you have just mutual yeah. connections with them. Lots of people, especially like, will just happily sit down. Even if it's nowadays, you can just tee up a half an hour call like very easily. And most people yeah. will slot you into their schedule like yeah. really easily. So yeah, I think that's really great advice. Yeah, it amaze, It sort of amazes me how little that happens in Australia, right? Where students or young grads sort of reaching out to folks and asking for coffee, like coffee to pick their brains, like that, it surprises me how little that happens. In the States, it, it's, it's almost a regular thing. You'll get your alumni or other folks just reaching out to you and, and it, it happens almost uh, every other day. Whereas here, I don't know, it, it, I don't think that's caught on yet. I also think like in, in the States, there's a, a stronger al like college alumni culture. So if you went to a certain university, you'll actively reach out to all of the folks that 
went to that university, regardless of where they are now, and, and sort of reach out and introduce yourself to them. Whereas in Australia, it doesn't really happen. It might be because there are just fewer universities in Australia compared to the States and, and people don't really have that sort of, not patriotism, but like feeling of like belonging for their universities. I, I don't think that sort of happens in Australia, right? Um, mm. Yeah, but definitely if, if you're a, a young student listening to this and then you're like, look, I, I looked, I'm applying to this company and there, there are folks there that I have mutual connections with, or I've gone to the same university that I've gone to, flick them an email. The worst case, like. They just leave you on red and that's it. Like they don't respond, but that, that's the worst case. You haven't lost anything. The, the best case scenario is that you have a really engaging conversation with them and whether they steer you towards the role or away from it, you'll learn something about the role that you probably wouldn't have known about and in save you potentially a mistake. So yeah, I, I think that's something I strongly advise people to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And it's, it's really cool even from that perspective of reaching out for certain roles that you want to do or even just mentorship in the if you want to improve at the current role you're doing as well i think that's really big and yeah i think like because it is so underutilized like you said in australia and i I agree that lots like many people don't consider doing this there's so much more value to get out of it because the people you are reaching out to don't usually get things like this and they're they're more than happy to help so i think you know it's important that you utilize that yeah. Uh, while it's still something that is uncommon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I can't think of a better way to differentiate yourself from the pool of graduates. And and probably graduates, grads don't know this, but when you're applying for a job, like you're one in thousands of applicants. And it's just unrealistic for people to go through thousands of applications. So to the extent that you can, and you can differentiate yourself, that's, that's a huge plus. I think there was a Tim Ferriss podcast sort of about this and about networking and how do I approach people. But he sort of talks about it more from an a entrepreneurial perspective. But I think the principles still apply. Like you have to be very careful about just cold, cold emailing, cold reaching out to people and saying, can I pick your brain? Because folks are generally busy and you have to be sort of conscious of their time and their calendars. I think you, you've got to sort of structure they, they look for two things. One is, you know, is this person legitimate? If I say yes, will they, you know, actually take this seriously? Will they show up on time? Mm-hmm. Do they, what do they have a past sort of background, whether tertiary or work experience to, to validate their interest? You know, so is this person legitimate? So that's sort of number one. And the second thing is, what is this person looking to get out of this? Do, what do they mean by just pick my brain? Is it just, you just want to have a coffee chat and get a referral out of me? Or do you genuinely have a specific question that you you would like me to help you out with. So I, I think when actually structuring this, I can elaborate on this a little bit more, but when you are cold reaching out to people, be, be very clear on what it is you actually want to get out of it. I think you have to be sort of wary of people's times and, and that's something to, to think about as well. So if you are looking for a referral, just say, look, I, I want to learn more about the role what some of the challenges are and and then if you're happy with this can you refer me to someone or if you're if you have a specific question actually like let them know i think just being efficient in this is is the name of the game yeah yeah i, I absolutely agree with that and i think being genuine is is so important and i think too like you were saying being specific with the ask as well it's, it's something that you know, i try and do when i'm asking people to come on the podcast as well which is a good exercise for this kind of thing where you know leading with some kind of value or something that's going on with their life and then maybe some context as to why you're reaching out to them and then then finishing with things that you specifically want to have the conversation about yeah. I think is really important. And even it just shows that you've gone to more effort to investigate them and what they're about and what they do and, and things like that. Because if they it's almost like if if you put in low effort and they say yes, then like mm-hmm. they've almost agreed to that's kind of the bar that they'll accept to speak to people and so people yeah. don't want to set that so low that they're going to say yes to anyone that's like yeah hey can i speak to you <laughs> do you know yeah. what i mean they're going to yeah. set it a bit higher so like they only speak to people that are actually genuinely interested in what they're doing so i think that's so important yeah absolutely and you have to put you know yourself in their shoes right yeah well when you've got sort of a, a tight sort of schedule you, you want to make it impactful and the best way to do that just being clear on what your je- objectives are and what you want to get out of it mm-hmm. yeah yeah Great. Well, I've got one last question for you, Hayes. We've covered so much in this in this sure. conversation, a lot of value yeah. here. But I want to ask one more, and it's a question I ask all the guests. And it's about if you were gr- graduating, maybe let's say starting next year, 
you're about to start your grad role, what is some advice or maybe one piece of advice that you would give yourself? Oh, well, that is a good question. I would say, think broad. Just, just, I, I would, I would tell myself that it's important to keep my own personal interests and hobbies and not lose them when, when going into a grad sort of role. I, I think the, the process of getting a grad job, I think is well documented and, and there's enough resources out there. But I think what we don't talk about is the importance of keeping your own personality and your, your own hobbies as you join your, your sort of big company, right? I think it's so easy. And I've seen this so many times when you're, you go through university, you've got all these hobbies and interests and passions, and then you enter the workforce and then it's all consuming, right? It's nine to five, but it's not really nine to five, right? It, mm. it's, it depends on what role you work for or, and what company you work for, but you'll be doing long hours. You'll, you'll find that you'll sometimes work on weekends and miss birthdays and dinners. But my looking back, so my thing is you want to keep your passions and interests and hobbies with you for as long as you can. And, and don't let your work life basically take over your whole life because it's easy to do that. There, there is always work. There will always be work. But, you know, if you're into sport or gym or dancing or teaching or mentoring or have a business or whatever, whatever it is that gives you that joy and satisfaction in your life, you need to keep that because you'll realize that there are times when work isn't great and whether you've had a tough week or it's, you're really stressed, you do rely on your personal hobbies and interests to basically pick you up from that. For a lot of people, it's their relationships with their partner or your faith or working out in the gym. The, the crazier work gets, the more important those parts of your life become to keep you mm. grounded and, and keep you sane. If you do get to a point where your work is all encompassing and you, there's nothing else, you'll burn out very quickly. You'll also look back and realize that all you've done is work and you've got nothing else to show for it. So. My, my advice to, for all these optimistic 21 year old grads is keep your hobbies, keep your interests, keep your passions work, and, and have, have work to be around that. Yeah. As opposed to just having work be the only thing that you have in life. It also makes you so much more interesting, knowledgeable. And the more senior you go, I feel like your relationships become super important in the workplace and you will draw on those experiences of traveling. Or, or having a business or working out, you'll draw on those parts of your life in order to build those relationships in the workplace, the more senior you get. So that's, that's something I'd, I'd probably recommend. There are a couple of sort of principles that I'd like to sort of cover as well. I, I think one of the things that sort of stuck with me is like Charlie Munger's mental models. I'm a big, big fan of Charlie Munger. And for folks that mm -hmm. don't know who he is, he's sort of the, almost the, the second in charge at Berkshire. So it helps out Warren Buffett and, and just one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. And he's got this interesting mental model called like the lattice theory. And I think this is really relevant for grads and folks listening to the show. And, and lattice theory is all about what are the developing niches in one area but also working on developing experience and skill sets in another area that it's totally unrelated, right? And you put those together and you find where the overlap is. And it's that in that overlap where you'll have a lot of growth. So what do I mean by this? So for example, and this is a really good case for entrepreneurs as well. So if you're an accountant, but you're also interested in dance and the arts. Figure out what the overlaps are between that. Can I be a, a financial advisor for a creative dance company? Or we'll figure out what, what the overlaps are and you'll find a ton of opportunities in those overlaps. If you're an engineer, but also are into design, figure out what overlaps exist between those industries and, and sort of dive in there. If you're a, a builder, but also are really into cars, figure out what the overlaps are between that and dive into that. So it's almost like, I, I call it the lattice theory. It's this mental model of figuring out exactly what are my current skills and interests and passions, and also try to develop sort of something else that's totally unrelated. Also develop that skills and, and ex uh, expertise in that area. And over time, you'll figure out that the overlap in those seemingly unrelated areas, you'll find a lot of growth and opportunities in there as well. So a really good example, I sort of picked this up from this YouTuber called Ali Abdel. I'm not, I'm sure you've probably heard of him. I feel like a lot of yeah. people have, but this, this is a, a YouTuber that combines med and like being a medical student and, and being an entrepreneur. And he's able to combine these seemingly unrelated things 
and, and do so well because he's in a space that there aren't many people right now, right? So the ability to combine two or three different niches and find what, what's the overlapping area what, and, and see if you can be in that space, you'll find that you're the only one there and you'll, you'll do really well. So I'm not sure if that sort of makes sense, James, but that's, that's a mental model that's stuck with me for a while. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. And I've, I've heard that even we've spoken about Tim Ferriss a few times today, but I've heard him describe that as well. And and there's a guy called Scott Adams. I don't know if you've heard of him, but yeah. he talks about this too, where it's like the, the stacking of things. And like you've said, where, you know, the, the crossover between things allows you to be, if you're the best, like if you're a good accountant and a good public speaker, for example, then maybe you're a really good public speaking, a public speaker about accounting right. stuff. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And then you, yeah. Once, as soon as you stack on like two or three of those, you can become really good at, and one of the best few people at that kind of niche thing that there won't be many people who are also sure. good at that thing. Yeah. And, and I, I always give this advice for a lot of my friends are sort of creatives, whether you're a, a musician or you're a chef, you're in that creative industry. If you can find another skill set that you're, you don't have to be an expert in, but remotely proficient, see where the overlaps are and see if you can be in that overlapping space. Uh, Cause you'll find that you'll be, there, there, there aren't that many people in that space and yeah, you, you'll find a lot of opportunities there. So I'd encourage sort of grads to think about that as well. The, the other sort yeah. of point I wanted to, to discuss quickly is I, I, I see a lot of sort of this misconception about working for fancy companies and fancy titles. I think there is, and, and that's natural, you know, folks want to work for large companies that are very prestigious and, and with fancy titles. My advice is to do a 180 and veer away from that. I think you're better off working for really competent managers, really inspirational people, as opposed to the biggest, biggest consulting company where you're, you know, like a, a small cog in a big, bigger sort of ecosystem. And I think that's, I, and that's not to say that you won't learn anything joining the big banks or joining the consulting companies. You'll get a fantastic grounding and understanding how businesses work. But my, if, if I'm an intern or if I'm a, a person about to start my first grad job, I would place more emphasis on the person I'm working for and the role and the skills and experience I will get as opposed to the name on my CV. I, I am part of the early work community, which is a Slack group of like Aussie founders and, and folks working in startup companies. And a lot of startup companies, most people haven't heard of, right? And so if you work at one of these startup companies and you go to a dinner party, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm head of growth at this startup. And no one's going to know what the company is, but that's okay, right? You're learning a lot. You're, you're building all these skills. You're, you're better off at least sort of as a grad and early in your career, learning as much as you can, being challenged in as many ways as possible, as opposed to working sort of in a large, sort of, in my view anyway, working in a large company where you're doing the same thing repeatedly over and over and over again. Um, sure, it might sound great on your CV, but I'm a big believer in in developing your skills and having really interesting experiences. And I, on my view is that you generally get that in smaller companies and in, in you know startups where you're working on a million things at once. Sure, you're an engineer, but you're, for example, you might be a software engineer, but you know, at a startup with ten people. You're helping out with product design. You're helping out with go-to-market strategy. You're, you're, you're wearing multiple hats. And mm. I think that's where you get a lot of growth. When I joined Airwallex, we were a Series C company. I sort of joined as a finance manager, but I did a whole bunch of stuff on tax, on, on go-to-market, on, on audit, on financial control, on budgeting, on, on FP&A, on like a whole bunch of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily see at a bigger company because all at a bigger company, you'd have each person looking at each of those things individually so yeah you know I, I, i'm connected to that find someone that inspires you and go work for that person so if if you want to go in a, in a certain profession and, and there's someone that's absolutely killing it and is super competent that you admire and respect reach out to them and say look can i shadow you for a week can i can i work in your team and and see if you can make that happen i might i really feel strongly about folks should be stay clear away from working at a company just for the name on the CV, but working at a company for the skills and the experiences that you'll develop along the way. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. And I think there's a, something we've spoken, I've spoken to people about on the podcast previously about generalization and specialization. And a lot of the things I've read and in people online or different things 
uh, like forums and stuff that I've read, a lot of the people that you know become more like successful are those people that have the general background and then they yeah. become like they're almost a general uh, a generalized specialist. Right? So they yeah. start off being yeah. a generalist and then they work to become a specialist in one of those areas, but they can still do like the whole. They're really still quite broad. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's I, I, the the mental model on this. I think it's called the the T theory where you want to be a generalist mm. sort of broad, but, and you want to sort of specialize, sort of go deep down in one area. And, and sort of touching back on what we previously said, if you can sort of go deep down one area or even two areas and find where, where that overlap is between those, then you've got opportunities there that you'll, that not many people will have because not many people are in those overlapping areas. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that's worked well for me and something that yeah, hopefully I can encourage people to do, do something similar. Yeah. yeah, I think that's great advice, certainly. And I think some of these things we've spoken about today through the whole podcast around mentoring, these kind of mental models, generalization, going overseas, seeking new opportunities, finding the right boss, all things like that are really fundamental things for a grad to know as they begin their career and really things that will save you a lot of time and a lot of headache if you can be conscious of them and hear them and then apply them early in your career to see you on the right path as you begin your career. So yeah, there's so much value in here, Haynes. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Sure. No worries, James. It was great. Happy to be be back on. And if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to shoot me a LinkedIn DM or find me at Haynes at 87advisory.com. 87 is the, the number 87. It's the name of my sort of advisor business. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to help. Great. Yeah. And we'll have those links to all Haynes's stuff and his contact details and everything in the show notes. So yeah, thanks so much again, Haynes, for coming on. And yeah, we'll see you around. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, James. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening to that episode with Haynes D'Souza. I think he is so, so passionate about graduates and about graduate careers. And we covered so much in that episode and so many little nuggets that are just, you know, can, can really make a big difference in your life and make a big difference in your career. If you want to find out more about Haynes, please follow the links in the description. And if you want to find out more about this episode and my takeaways, if you want to see them, Go to graduatetheory.com and find the link to this episode. The link will also be in the show notes. And if you want to get this kind of information, if you want to get my takeaways and different episodes straight to your inbox, please consider subscribing to the newsletter. Alternatively, whatever podcast platform you're listening on, you can also subscribe there. Listening and sharing this episode really help grow the podcast. So I would really appreciate it if you could share this episode with a friend and get the good message out there. Thanks so much again for listening today. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.